Good morning and welcome to another edition of the National Newspaper Publishers Association's Let It Be Known. Today, we talk to West Side Gazette publisher Bobby Henry and columnist Perry Busby on the overdue exonerations of the Groveland Four, Charles Greenlee, Walter Irvin, Samuel Shepard, and Ernest Thomas, each accused of raping a white woman more than 70 years ago. The Ku Klux Klan killed one of the men and the county sheriff in Florida killed another, claiming he was trying to escape from prison. Although Governor Ron DeSantis granted them pardons two years ago, the men's families are feeling a sigh of relief today because on Monday, a judge finally exonerated them. We will discuss that in a moment. But first, let us check out the headlines for this morning. And we start with some breaking news that broke overnight, some sad, sad breaking news late last night. Malik activist Malcolm X was found dead inside her Brooklyn home on Monday evening, according to two senior police officials. The 56-year-old Shabazz was found unconscious and unresponsive inside her home on East 28th Street in Midwood just before 4.30 p.m. She was later pronounced dead. The city's medical examiner responded to the scene and said the incident was not deemed suspicious. A cause of death has yet to be determined. Uh, Malika Shabazz has died at the age of 56. And our condolences go out to the Shabazz family. This morning, we are continuing to follow the trial of the men who killed Ahmad Aubrey. The trial uh, continues with closing argu arguments this morning from the state. Following the prosecutor's close, the judge will then instruct the jury and they can begin deliberating. The trial has been closely watched as just one black person is serving on a jury that had 1,000 who initially showed up for jury duty. Defense lawyers also repeatedly have asked for mistrials simply because of the presence of Reverends Al Sharpton and Jesse Jackson and other black pastors. And yesterday, during the defense close, the victimization of Ahmaud Arbery continued. The defense attorneys for Greg and Travis McMichael, who are charged with Arbery's murder, repeatedly have tried to present Arbery as a criminal. On Monday, Laura Hogue, one of Gregory McMichael's lawyers, went even further. This is the utterly disgusting thing she had to say. She told the jury, turning Ahmad Arbery into a victim after the choices that he made does not reflect the reality of what brought Ahmad Arbery to Satilla Shores in his khaki shorts with no socks to cover his long, dirty toenails. Ahmad Arbery's mother totally objected, uh, walked out of the courtroom. Uh, she was, as you would imagine, distraught, talking about his long, quote, dirty toenails. As Ahmad Arbery's mother said, uh, they didn't want to talk about the large hole they left in his chest when they shot him. Going to bring on now uh, the publisher of the West Side Gazette uh, down in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, uh, Bobby Henry. Bobby Henry joins us now on Let It Be Known. Good morning, Bobby Henry. Oh, good morning, Stacy. You just hit me in the gut, man. I uh, that's that is uh, so disturbing, man. I mean, I, this, this is I, I gotta I gotta regroup. You mean to tell me that these people? Uh, how low can you go, man? How how vile can you be? Um, yeah. I, I don't know that that kind of. Well, and you know, Bobby, the underlying thing has been this, and 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 people, you don't have to really uh, think long and hard of where this comes from. But the argument from the defense in the case um, of the McMichael brothers and a uh, father and son team, and and this Mr. Bryant, Roddy Bryant, has been. Ahmad Aubrey had no business in that neighborhood. <laughs> it's 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 such a there there you know well Bobby speak to that. <laughs> yeah, man, you know I and, and I'm trying to, Stacey. You and I had a conversation yesterday, so I'm trying to get in line with what you were talking about. But man, Stacey, you got to be kidding me, man. So they're trying to paint every picture they can to to prove that th this type of person shouldn't be in that neighborhood. What the heck is going on, man? I, I don't understand that. I, I know we're supposed to be talking about the Groveland Four, 
which well, is well, we, we're going to get to that, Bobby, but we're, we're going to spend some uh, just a little yeah. time on this as well. But it, yeah, you know, man. how in the hell can you talk about a, 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 a deceased person's uh, anatomy uh, and you don't discuss what you're there for? And for I agree with the mother, you didn't talk about the hole in the man's chest, so what are you doing? What are you saying? This is some low life individual. I, I, I don't. I mean, you know, Stacey, I'm trying my best to uh, to understand. And maybe we, we will never understand because we're not that racist person uh, who, who's doing this. So it's difficult for us to understand that. Uh, I, yeah. I, I, it, you know, we've heard, Bobby, it, it, and you you are really expressing, uh, I, I think, a lot of sentiment, a lot of people's sentiment. But we, we, we've heard defense tactics used in cases. Um, but this one is outright, it just has yeah. that over overture. You know, it's you say understand, we overstand where they're coming mm -hmm. from because it comes from a place that's deep and dark. And a place, you know, they're down in Georgia in the south. It mm -hmm. comes from that, you know, that south, that southern mm -hmm. uh it, it, hatred, that, really. That, you know, let, let me not mince words, right? It comes no, from no. that deep-seated uh hatred that that we know that. You know, Dr. Chavis likes to quote Malcolm X, and, and again, our condolences go out to the Shabazz family this yes. morning. But Doc, Dr. Chavis likes to quote um, Malcolm X by saying everything uh, south of the Canadian border, uh, you know, is, is, is you it's know, south. what it is, right? And Stacey, I, I'm, I'm trying to uh, encapsulate this if I could. The, 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 the trials and the, and the circumstances and the things that are happening. Uh, from from the mowing down of people in the parade in a, in a state where where where, where they have uh, uh, acquitted uh, a young boy uh, uh, who who didn't don't even have a the right to bear an arm to bear an arm and to kill people. So this whole thing is is a uh, uh, a picture of what is transpiring because of situations like this. You know, uh, just to to open up a Jet magazine and to see Emmett Till's body. Uh, 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 you know, exposed to the world to see. Now these people are are, are using um, a dead man's body uh, to 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 say to the world that this person, who perhaps toenails were unkept like mine at a time, you know, to say that he does not belong. What 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 are, what are we coming to, man? Yeah, you know? and you know, here's the other thing, Bobby. The the owner of this house that Ahmad mm -hmm. Arbery had went into this unfinished house that was mm -hmm. open uh, that he went to the owner said others had gone into the house as well. The owners also said that he wasn't committing any crime. The mm -hmm. owners of the house said they had no problem with it. Yeah, and still the, these hillbilly jackass men who who have become slave catchers, you know, uh, and, and 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 their mentality. To, 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 to kill this man, you know, for being where they thought he should not be. Yeah. Stacy, I, I, you know, you, 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 you quelled me on yesterday. You know, you, you, you calmed me on yesterday with some very moving uh, words that, that, that book of life, you know, that, 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 yes. that we all need to adhere to at a point before we find ourselves just totally go, blown away, just gone, yeah. you know, just, I mean, yeah. I, it's, I, it's it's too much for Bobby. Uh, yeah. We're gonna continue to watch. Um, you know, it, it's gonna be interesting as the jury gets the case today. How long will they deliberate? Mm -hmm. uh, and obviously, the most important question is going to be what is the verdict uh, from this jury? And and keep in mind, mm -hmm. again, it's uh, uh, this county, uh, Glenn County, um, down in Georgia, is is predominantly, overwhelmingly uh, white. Mm -hmm. They overwhelmingly have the views of uh, McMichael. They overwhelmingly have the views of Rowdy Bryant. They overwhelmingly have the views of that prosec uh, of that defense attorney mm -hmm. who talked about the long, dirty toenails. Um, one black juror was selected. One thousand jurors, potential jurors, came to that courthouse. One thousand, and they pick one black juror. So. Um, Claudette Perry, um, the NMPA's executive administrator, she says it's open season on killing black people. This is almost unbelievable. And then she goes on to say what they are really saying is Arbery doesn't deserve to live because his toenails are long. Outrageous. Outrageous. And Angela Connolly says pure freaking 
racism. Um, we want to say good morning to Karen Carter, which is our chair, uh, who's also watching among the many. And, and another item this morning, um, Bobby, uh, we, we will be covering that, obviously, as it moves forward. But another item this morning, uh, as families continue to mourn their losses from the devastating crowd surge that killed 10 people and injured hundreds earlier mm -hmm. this month at Travis Scott's Astro World Festival, yeah. Public Enemies frontman Chuck D wrote an open letter speaking out against Live Nation, the concert promoter. And this is what Chuck had to say. Chuck says, I am tired of these corporations shucking their most crucial responsibility. These folks simply say, rest in peace and move on. This negligence can't continue. Folks want answers. I'm not buying the young black man did it, he said. Mm -hmm. he's, mm -hmm. he's being blamed, Chuck says, for a crime while the old white men running the corporations that Travis and his fans trusted with their lives stay quiet in the shadows, counting their money and watching their stock prices go up and up. The excuse of Scott's irresponsible actions don't wash. If his act had a history of that behavior, why promote him to bigger venues? Why partner with him in the first place and let him headline a bigger audience? Live Nation control the show. They control almost all of the concert venues. Artists ain't speaking out because these same cats are already bought by these corporations. No one can say a word against them unless they want to be blacklisted and hurt their careers. Chuck D continued by blasting Live Nation's president and CEO Michael Rapino and other major concert promoters for their lack of accountability, urging them to seek change to protect event goers. Chuck cont continues, he says, so I am calling on Michael Rapino's entire team at Live Nation and consortium of all the major concert promoters out there to do the right thing, to step up and step out of the shadows, to fix these situations and save lives, to stop letting one young black man yes, take sir. the blame, the hate, the fall. We don't know everything that happened or exactly what failed, but concert promoters have all the power to make the changes to keep everyone safe and alive. He concluded by saying, Live Nation, your stock is up. The white corporate music business keeps cashing in on black pain, yes. trauma, and death. This has to stop yesterday. You are a part of the problem. Hmm. Grow up, fix this, and let us all live in peace. Strong, strong words. Mm -hmm. And you can expect no less from Chuck D, who's a very good friend of the black press, uh, with these words. Uh, and welcome, uh, Dr. Yes. Benjamin Chavis. Dr. Chavis, our president and CEO, has he snuck into the room, Bobby? Yeah, I see. He came from from center court. <laughs> all right, he came yes, from center court. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning, Good all. Morning. Um, uh, Stacy Brown, Bobby Henry, and to all of our listeners on behalf of the National Newspaper Publishers Association, Karen Carla Richards, our distinguished chair, publisher of the Forward Times in Houston, Texas, and two hundred and thirty. African American owned newspapers, including Bobby Henry, who was one of our <laughs> leading uh, publishers at the West Side Gazette down in South Florida. Uh, you know, uh, this is a great day for us to keep moving forward. Uh, you know, we have so much uh, to be thankful for, uh, to be grateful for, and we're going to keep pushing forward. Yeah, and, and um, I want to go back to Chuck D's uh, statement, Bobby. Uh, yeah. First, I want to shout out to Tandy. Matanga, who is watching this morning from Zimbabwe. Welcome, um, uh, Tandy. Thanks for watching. Bobby, uh, yes. what's your reaction to that? I, he oh, I heard you as I was reading it, the statement, um, uh, your reaction to Chuck D's statement. Right on Chuck D. I mean, you know, uh, he hit the nail on the head. And, and, and uh, it did two things. Uh, for those of us who say, well, I had a feeling, I knew that this was going to happen as it pertains to the different trials and different scenarios. To them, I want to say, you know it's raining outside, right? So does that mean you're not going to get a raincoat? So so, so we have to, even though we know or suspect things to, to, that's going to happen, we have to prepare ourselves for that. And then when it does happen, we have to come up with a remedy for that too. And what Chuck D was saying, I, I think a lot of artists, or some uh, prolific artists who, who want to take control for themselves has said long time ago, Let's take 
uh, uh, our ownership on what we have and let's write the narrative ourselves. Anytime we put it in, in the hands of those who only look at it as a money venture, it doesn't matter what happens to the to the artists or the fans. It's about the monies. So I say congratulations, Chuck D. Keep it up, brother. And we all need to pay attention to what Chuck is saying and what we're saying ourselves when things happen. Yes, you may think that, well, I knew this was going to happen. Well, what in the Sam heck are you doing to prevent it from happen happening? And that goes for all of us. So, yeah, David Kelly, who's watching as well, David E. Kelly says the black artists should boycott Live Nation because they have exploited and monopolized black music concerts and black promoters are being denied equal access to our own artists. And we know that uh, just as a footnote here, um, it's not a footnote to Travis Scott, but it's a footnote and to this conversation. Um, Travis Scott has, is facing now a, more than $750 million in lawsuits. Um, so we will, again, continue to follow that as well. But this morning, Bobby, we want to talk about uh, the Grove in Four. In the summer of 1949, a 17-year-old lodged an accusation that would thrust the rural Florida community of Groveland into decades-long turmoil. The white teenager told police she and her husband were driving home from a dance when they were attacked by four young black men who abducted and raped her at gunpoint. The claims made by Norma Paget, who is now in her 80s, set off a manhunt that spurred an onslaught of violence against black residents of Groveland near Orlando, mobilizing the National Guard and prompting Thurgood Marshall, then a lead attorney for the NAACP, to take up the cause of the men who would come to be known as the Groveland Four. And just yesterday, the, the four men were finally exonerated. Uh, Bobby, I know that this is something that you've been following. You've even written about it. Mm -hmm. uh, your, your thoughts on that situation down in Florida. Okay, let, let me first say, say thank you to uh, State Representative Bobby DeBose and uh, Evan Jenny, who really pushed uh, for this to, to happen, uh, the exoneration. They started this fight back in, I think it was uh, 2017, perhaps. Uh, so, 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 so here, there is a backstory to this, you know, as in a lot of cases pertaining to uh, instances of this black men allegedly raping white women and the whole town getting burned down. Uh, uh, the, 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 the Shepherd family in Groveland uh, was a hardworking family that had farmland and other stuff that white folk wanted. So, so this led to uh, white people coming in, trying to take the Shepherd's land. Uh, Paget and, and some other folk lived in the, in, in, the, in the central area of the Shepherd's farm. So they knew each other. Now it was alleged that uh, 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 Norma Paget uh, uh, and her husband uh, had been on rocky grounds ever since they got married. Norma might have been uh, a lady of the town, if you will, and her husband uh, uh, had some issues too. But anyway, one thing led to another. Uh, the night of the incident, alleged incident, where Norma said she was. Her husband was beaten up and she was raped by four black men, set this whole thing ablaze. One brother was killed uh, in the woods. The other three uh, were, 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 were killed. Two were killed in the custody of the police while handcuffed. Well, two were shot in the custody of the police while handcuffed. One of them lived to tell the story. Mm -hmm. He went on. I'm sorry. Go ahead. You said something? Stacey? No, no. Go ahead. OK, so so the one that 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 lived told the story, uh, which allowed the investigation to happen, but it never was an investigation. Thurgood Marshall came in, uh, did his thing, wanted the, the brother to plead to, to saying he did it so he could have his life. But the brother said, no, I'm not, I'm not lying. Even if it means that I have to go to the electric chair, I'm not going to lie for something that I didn't do. Anyway, to, to, to speed this thing up, his family, uh, the brother of the the, the 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 alleged perpetrator his his brother uh was a good mechanic in the town everybody knew him and he was a respected person so anyway move time moves forward i think it was in 1998 somewhere there about he and his wife his second wife were at home and a knock came to the door the person who came to the door was norma patchett who had since remarried she came in to tell uh the brother 
that the story she told was a lie that mm. the rape never happened mm. so, wow. yeah. mm -hmm. you know I, i'm right. so so glad uh bobby again the black press is so important uh mm -hmm. we, we talk about this and this is not tooting our own horn it's just facts mm -hmm. so you oh you get that in-depth insight from the west side gazette a member of the National Newspaper Publishers Association, which represents the Black Press of America and has been for 81 years. Uh, mm -hmm. That's the unvarnished truth about it, right? We see, you said she came to the door. I got to tell you, now, what I've seen in mainstream press is that she she kept recanting, but she says she maintained, although she recanted a few times, she says, you know what? I told the truth. They did this to me. And, and they leave it at that. They don't go into the stories that the West Side Gazette has gone into. They don't go into the stories that the black press has gone into it. Um, want to welcome William Smothers uh, uh, from the Speaking Out News in Huntsville, Alabama. William, we got to have you on Let It Be Known as well. Dr. Chavis, I know that uh, you wanted to comment on this uh, Grove and Four as well. So I'm going to- Well, you know, you. Um, I'm going to thank Bobby Henry first for giving us that history, for giving us that truth. And this is why we need the black press, uh, Brother Bobby. Uh, the Groland Four, the New York 21, the Chicago Seven. Wilmington 10. The Wilmington 10, <laughs> the Charlotte Three, the Raleigh Two, the Wilmington Three. I mean, it goes on and on and on. Uh, the Scottsboro Board Brothers, remember mm -hmm. them? Mm -hmm. So I, I think that, um, uh, I'm, 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 thank God that the lady came forward and admitted that she lied. That's number one. You remember now uh, that the uh, lady who uh, claimed that um, Emmett Till uh, uh, made a strange eye of Whistler her now admits, oh, she also admitted that, that she lied. So I, I, I think that it's something fundamentally, not something, there's extraordinarily uh racist systemic racism in the criminal justice system with a mere allegation of toward a black person you automatically assume that you're guilty look look what look what the defense counsel of the three white men that are accused of killing Ahmad Albury in Georgia uh just yesterday the defense counsel talked about what he had on his short pants and talked about his toenails. What does that have to do with the murder of our brother? And so uh, all these justifications, I'm glad Bobby went in depth because it exposes how vulnerable black men, black women, black families, black community, other people of color are still are in America because we have not fixed, we have not even come close to fixing America's race problem. You know what, Bobby, too, I want you to um, think about this, too, and, and give me some thoughts on this. Uh, you, you know, I, let me start by saying this is not an anti-Me Too thing. Uh, you know, I appreciate the thought behind Me Too, but it becomes so dangerous when it comes to African-American men in particular to suggest that they are guilty immediately because of an accusation. What we're talking about, and even members of our audience um, are bringing up uh, incidents as Dr. Chambers broke down and uh, Jelani Bakari mentions the Martin Martinville seven uh, and right. so so many others. Um, so it became a dangerous situation I, and, and even more dangerous uh, after the Harvey Weinstein verdict, which many believe it's a just verdict after he was convicted. The, I thought the Manhattan district attorney said something extremely dangerous um, and I called him on it. Um, he, he said he stood by it when I called him on it, but he said the mere accusation, the mere accusation should lead to a conviction itself. Ex extremely dangerous, especially if your skin looks like mine's Dr. Chavis and yours, Bobby. Yeah. Yeah. An, an extreme the accusation part. Uh, so, 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 okay. And I, let me, let me do this. Uh, assimilation. Okay. When we when we find ourselves assimilating uh, to a degree where um, we think that there is equal justice and 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 we could do or or, or be criminalized uh, for doing what other people have done, we have given up 
uh, put ourselves in a position that a statement like that could be made. Now, on, on the on the with the with the hashtag Me Too, this is extremely delicate. From what 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 is it? Pro pro women, um, um, the women's movement. We have to be real careful, brothers and sisters, not for us to buy into that ideology. That ideology is set up already to put us behind uh, a, a curtain, if you will. You know, so 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 when we find ourselves assimilating, then we find ourselves exposed to those type of uh, identifications from judges and other individuals. So, well, and uh, and Andrew Khan only says an, an accusation should mean investigation exactly, um, and and that's that's the one thing that. Uh, we can all, I, I hope we can all agree on that an accusation does deserve an investigation, but an accusation does not and should not automatically paint the individual as guilty. The most dangerous thing is to take away that presumption of innocence, particularly, again, for Black Americans. We, we have seen this from, from before Jim Crow, through Jim Crow to today. Um, so it is a very dangerous thing. An accusation, an accusation from us on us means incarceration. That's what it is, and you know. So we have to be very careful and address that. Well, the family of the Groveland for um, the, the surviving family members uh, say that the reason why yesterday's uh, decision by the judge was so important to them, while they had um, been pardoned uh, by the governor, uh, the pardon does not mean innocent. And so what the judge did yesterday was declare them innocent. And they said now that they could sleep better, they can rest better. Uh, Bobby, that that was really important for that family, right? Yeah, yeah. I remember in, in, in 2017 when, when State Representative Bobby DeBose, uh, he, does, he does a program called Walk Through History. And on this particular occasion, it was concerning the Groveland Four. Uh, he had family members. He had a young, a young white boy by the name of Ben Polsky. I think that's how you pronounce his name. Ben, at 10 years old, he and his sister and some other classmates, uh, they wrote a book. They raised funds. Uh, they brought attention to uh, the Groveland Four to help uh, Bobby, uh, State Representative Bobby DeBose and Evan Jennings move this legislation along to make this happen. The sister, the, the niece, and one of, uh, I want to say a sister, I can't remember exactly, but the family was there and we had a, we had an open conversation. And I tell you, it, it was during that time too that the family said that this lady had lied, you know, but, but, but the other media wasn't picking this up. Uh, uh, the Governor Scott at the time, nobody wanted, nobody wanted to address this issue because it meant that again, Black men, black men were innocent, but yet they were put on display and, and, and to be uh, uh, dehumanized by the allegations of white women. You see? Yeah. 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 Bill Gladson, a local prosecutor who set the, um, the, the, the wills in motion for this and filed paperwork to get everything tossed against, all the charges tossed against these uh, four individuals. He said, we followed the evidence to see where it led us and it led us to this moment. And, and really, um, and I know we're we are over time here, but it, that is really what should be done in the first place, right? And then this, this is why you hear that saying, uh, justice delayed is justice denied because these men are dead and now, uh, you know, they're not here to 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 celebrate their ultimate uh, clearing of their names, Bobby. Yeah. You know, Gil Scott Heron, Heron had a song called It's Winter, it's winter Time in America. You know, we, there, there was a, there was a, a noted period during the summer when, when when riots would happen. You know, America would be set on fire during the summer. But it's winter here in America now, and it still it still permeates with hatred, systemic racism, and 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 the building blocks, the foundation of of of, of injustices 
uh, uh, is deep rooted in the allegations of black men raping white women. This stigma has created a foundation that is uh, being, uh, how do I say, compounded, compounded. And, and when we don't address issues of the Martinville 7, of the Wilmington 10, of the Groveland 4, or the, the Orange Park 5 out of New York, when we don't address those issues, uh, not only from a, a, a clinical standpoint, but from the point of, of, of saying, okay, let's take, a, let's take a human look at this away from, from color. Let's look at this from a spiritual eye. How can we continue to allow uh, this type of murder, this type of hatred to continue, and we don't address it? And for those white folk who sit by and allow it to happen, you are just as guilty as the ones who are committing the crime. And then you brothers and sisters who say, oh, I knew that this was going to happen. And you don't do anything to prepare yourself for to, to, to stop, then you are perpetuating. We are perpetuating this circumstance to continue. And, and we are just as much at fault as those who are driving the cars to run down parade uh, attendees or pulling the trigger of a, of a Ryan House or or, or sitting on the neck of George Floyd, we are just as guilty until we stand up and say enough is enough. So, okay. All right, right Bobby Henry, please now on calls. Yes, sir. <laughs> the Black Press, brothers and sisters. Continuity, aluta continuity. How you say it, Doc? Aluta continua. The yes, struggle there continues. You go. It, yes, it definitely sir. continues. And listen, yes, Bobby Henry, it's always great to have Bobby Henry, the uh, publisher of the West Side Gazette down in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. And Bobby is going to be our host publisher yeah. for the NMPA's Midwinter Training Conference, which kicks off on January the 19th. We'll be at the Diplomat Beach Resort in Hollywood, Florida through the 22nd, where the theme is the publishing industry, advancing the black press of America, reaffirming, engaging, and empowering. Visit www.nmpa-events.com to register and reserve hotel rooms in order to get the NMPA special discounted rate. And believe me, it's a very special rate. That hotel is beautiful. Mm -hmm. uh, the hotel rooms must be reserved by December 12th. That is the NMPA's midwinter conference. We're going to be meeting in person for the first time in about two years. We're looking forward to that. And our Black fact of the day, born in Crescent City, Florida, A. Philip Randolph was a labor leader and civil rights activist who founded the nation's first major Black union, the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters in 1925. In the 1930s, his organizing efforts helped end both race, racial discrimination in defense industries and segregation in the U.S. Armed Forces. Randolph was also a principal organizer of the March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom in 1963, which paved the way for passage of the Civil Rights Act the following year. Our Black Fact of the Day is courtesy of A. Philip Randolph. We thank you for watching. Everybody stay safe and stay well, and we will see you tomorrow.